So today um, we get the fun job of talking about architectural diagrams. And for whatever reason, this lecture is always a fun one for me. Um, it's, it's something, architectural diagrams are something that you guys are going to have to do throughout your careers as students and ultimately as professionals in this world. And I think it's, it's kind of one of the fun things that we get to do. It's, it's the closest thing in the computer to sketching freehand uh, in terms of just getting our ideas out and, and talking about what, what makes um, you know, something work or, or something a, a particularly good design, et cetera. Um, so today we are going to focus on architectural diagrams rather than just um, you know, diagramming in general or sketching in general, uh, which means I get to show a bunch of examples, which are always fun too. Um, and that's, that's certainly more enjoyable uh, for me. But let's first start by talking about what is a diagram. And so I think the easiest way of explaining a diagram is that a diagram is like a one-liner joke. There's, there's one thing that you're trying to describe that has to do about this particular building. Maybe you're trying to describe how the sun flows into a building. Maybe you're trying to describe what places are public, what places are private. It's a very simple description of a building. And I think a lot of times diagrams, uh, when you guys are working in 220 or 221, you come up with a diagram that's far too complicated. It's really meant to be simple. It's meant to be understood quickly. Uh, and it gives us a clear overview or an idea of what that particular design spark was. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see a bunch of examples today. And I'll, I'll try to um, showcase what that, that little spark is and what the diagram is, is in trying is trying to do. That being said, it's rare when one diagram will suffice to describe the whole architectural project. So a lot of times you need a series of diagrams, one identifying several different things, you know, one for each, each design element. In terms of learning to diagram, the, the best thing to do is to just practice. The more you draw, the more you try to distill your ideas down into something simple, the easier it's going to be to diagram. And so for me, whipping up a few diagrams is going to be a lot easier than you because I have lots more years of practice in doing this. So today it's going to be about practicing and figuring out the techniques to best showcase your, your ideas. And I think this is one of the things that happens uh, in the world of 220. And I know you guys are primarily in 121, uh, though a few of you are past that. But when you move into that kind of design studio level, you're constantly going to be asked, hey, give me a couple diagrams of your idea so that we can quickly have a dialogue about what your project is. And so you have to be very quick at getting this out. Really, sketchbooks are the best place for this because you can get your little drawings out. It's rare that a sketchbook is so precise and measured. It's usually just a quick sketch. And a sketch can turn into a diagram really, really easily. Um, if you're struggling, try adding color, cutting out images, adding text. Try a different medium. If you're comfortable in pen, add you know, a Prismacolor marker or something like that. So here's a couple examples of uh, some sketchbooks from me in grad school. Um, this was one where you can tell that nothing actually occurred in the sketchbook. They all occurred outside on, on various pieces of paper and whatever. And I was big on, I drew on whatever was close. So it didn't matter that it was in my sketchbook. If I didn't have it with me, it didn't matter. I just drew. And then I ultimately collected and taped a bunch of these things into my sketchbook uh, or stuck them in. And, and that seemed to work. As I uh, moved forward in grad school, I decided that I would really liked a smaller sketchbook that I could keep with me. Um, and I bought, a, it's a little tiny moleskin, but it had um, a Japanese fold in the paper. So it was one continuous length of paper. I should grab it. I still have a few of them in my office. Uh, it's one continuous length of paper, so you can actually draw larger and across the folds, um, which worked out pretty nicely. My sketchbooks tended to have a lot of text with them um, because I wrote lots of notes while I was sketching. Uh, but you can kind of see it's kind of a random assortment of stuff that ends up flowing from page to page. So let's look at some actual diagram types and therefore examples of each type. And I think one of the big things about diagramming is no matter how much I can say, hey, these are the six techniques of diagramming, the truth is that there's a lot more techniques than just those six. And most of the time, they're all intermingled. So while I might say pull out arrows and flow lines as one category, well, when we get down to movement, a lot of times the diagrams are done with arrows and, and flow lines. So it's not necessarily always neatly in one of these categories. And a lot of the images that I'll show you kind of cross over. Or maybe you'll have one that uses one strategy, and the next one will use a different strategy. 
Um, so it's just important to be aware that there's a variety of examples. So we're going to talk about figure ground. Then we're going to talk about highlighting, which is color coding. We're going to talk about arrows and flow lines. We'll talk about highlighting building components or pulling out pieces of a building and showcasing those. We'll do text and typographic diagrams, which can be very, very effective. And then we'll talk about movement through particular spaces and how we diagram those. So let's start first with the figure ground. Figure ground is de destined for things with strong contrast. This is public space. This is private space. This is um, you know, a bathroom. This is a bedroom. It's, it's a stark contrast, something like that. And so we, we show this as a solid and a void, something black, something white. It's, a, it's not something that has a gray area. It's, it's one or the other. And so this uh, strategy goes way back uh, to Gian Battista, Gian Battista Noli's plan of Rome in 1748. Um, this was what Rome looked like in 1748. Instead of drawing the buildings, however, he drew this plan as just a diagram of public and private space. So we see the city of Rome in this context. So everything that is black in this map or plan is private space, and everything that is white is public space. So it ends up being rather interesting, because if we look, certainly the city streets, the things that you would expect, Right? Those are all white, because they're obviously public space. But if you look at all the churches in Rome, right, things like this, the interiors of the churches are also public space. You can just walk right in. So that is considered public space. So we have the squares. right? In this instance, Piazza del Popolo is there. Uh, but it's also the churches. And you can tell, obviously, that there's lots and lots of little churches in public space in Rome. But it gives us a really good sense of what is the city of Rome. What can you access as a public person versus private residences or private space? So this is adapted all the time. Chances are you've seen the same strategy. You've gone to a museum and they have something like this. So here's an example of different levels of a museum. We have the public space identified in white. This is the spot that you can access. The, the back of the house, the stuff that you can't access, is um, in light blue. So it's the same strategy. It can be done in diagram form by drawing. It can be done in model form. Very, very similar to that. This is um, from Rem Koolhaas's Office of Metropolitan Architecture. Um, this is in a model. It has to do with a solid and a void. So dense space, it ends up being a library. And this library is therefore about the stacks and the density of the books versus the open reading rooms. But in model form, we look at something like this, and you can see all of these little voids that are inside the big mass of space. So we're still getting this solid and void. It just happens to be in model form instead of in diagrammatic form. Now, of course, there are a series of diagrams that go with this. This was a study model that kind of shows that. But here's all the diagrams. These are sections rather than plans. But we see that density, that mass of books as black. And we see the places where you could read or inhabit or enjoy the space as these little white voids that float through the building. We flip into plan, and we slice a bunch of plans. These are the dense mass of books versus the open space. And so you can see this works really well as a diagrammatic technique. We can learn an awful lot about what this building is going to feel like based on these little studies. Uh, this is a book, The Endless City, uh, diagrams a bunch of different things about cities. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I think this is a similar way of looking at it. Um, and they contrast certain, um, as you go through the book, they contrast specific things. Um, and so we see the makeup of these cities in various colors in comparison to one another uh, based on this information. And they use a little bit more of a shade of color, um, but it's very much in the same vein. Another example here looks very much like the, the Noli's plan of Rome. Um, this is another adaptation of that similar strategy where we take the plan uh, that is in, in plan view, and then we reorganize the pieces. It's kind of fun. So let's move on to another diagrammatic technique. This is called highlighting. Um, and highlighting is basically trying to show differences within the design framework 
to accent those with that diagram. It can be done in model. It can be done in drawing. Right? You can color code pieces of your model. Similarly, you can do it in drawing. Sometimes color coding is the best way of describing it. Color coding, to me, pinholes you into it has to have color. Uh, highlighting, you could do it just with a change of tone or a change of uh, you know, something is a little bit darker than something else. Um, but you get the idea. So you might have something like this, old building, new building. New, new regions are in red. Old, old um, exhibits are in yellow. Um, blue is that public space where you first enter the museum. So you're color coding. These are different parts of the building. Right? Maybe you have a building that has office, business support. Uh, what is this? Welfare services, meeting facilities. Right? You're identifying parts of the building and you're coloring those in so you could see, hey, at quick glance, we understand what these various pieces of the building are and how they assemble to make the whole building. This is something from um, Alex Holgreff, the visualizing architecture guy that I've shown examples of when we did the portfolio lecture. Uh, I'll show some of his examples because I think they're well done as well. Uh, but in this context, very color saturated images, and he's using that color coding to his advantage. We talked a lot about color last class, right? The color palette he's picking is on purpose. They contrast nicely with one another. The red versus the cyan, or, or really light green, uh, work well in contrast. Using them both in plan view and in perspective view as to, to how those come together. Another page here. Um, similar, he's, he's talking about particular view corridors and highlighting those view corridors. Um, I can show you here. This colored region, this colored region correspond to the view. So if we're looking out this way, it would be this view down here. If we were looking out this way, it would be this view. If we're looking off in this direction, we'd see that. And if we're looking off in that direction, we'd see this. So there's a nice correlation of views. So it's diagrammatic, but we're still getting a lot of information out of this. Something like this, um, very, very diagrammatic building forms, different colors represent different pieces of the building. Now, I don't know anything about this building. I don't know what they were trying to do. But even not knowing anything about this particular building, I understand that there's three different volumes that are stacked together, and each of those volumes is doing something different. Now, sometimes you need a little code or a key on the side that explains what this stuff is, but sometimes you can still tell that there are different um, things happening. So this one, to me, is, is probably a little bit over the top in terms of its color coding. It's a little bit too rainbow. Uh, and this is something I was talking about last class when we were, when we were discussing color theory, in that sometimes you, you end up picking too many colors. And so in a diagram like this, we have essentially every color of the rainbow. Perhaps going with just a few analogous colors could get us the same direction without it looking quite so colorful uh, and stand out. If you imagine this particular drawing on a big board with lots of other drawings, either all the other drawings would have to have lots and lots of colors in them, or this would stand out dramatically more than anything else. And so you have to make sure that that's intent. This also, besides having the color coding, has a bunch of arrows on it which is going to segue us into the arrow section. But this is a good example of a diagram that has both the color coding and the arrows. Another example here of color coding. Uh, again, I don't know the context in which this, this would be, but obviously there's a, there's a distinct difference between the red, the blue, and the black in this context. Another example here where we have something that is the density or the, the red, right? Remember color associations, right? That's, that's the active movement side. Blue is the, the calming side. It's got to be the, the water or the nature or something like that. And the building falls in between these two uh, pieces. Another example of color coding, we've got a building form. First two don't matter so much. The third one is green terraces. This is the landscape part of this particular conglomeration building. Then we move into a series of diagrams. So same view over and over again, but just the various colors tell us different components of the building. We've got blue for offices. We've got the red for the housing. We've got the purple for the hotel and restaurant. Remember, purple associated with luxury. It makes sense that they pick purple. I'm just reinforcing why you pick a particular color. And then we can start to combine those, those shapes together to see how they evolve or change over time. Another example here, I think again, very, very graphic in its nature of color. 
but working through a couple different design ideas and how those, those various ideas work together to form the building as a whole. Arrows is another great way of showing something in a particular building. And arrows could be movement, we'll talk about movement uh, a little bit later on, but they could also be indicative of this is a particular view, this is a particular um, you know, point that is important, this is how air flows through a building or something like that. So we can use arrows to show a lot of different things. I really like this example over here um, because in this example we see kind of a building theater and we see just without even the arrows in it at the bottom here we see how people enter the building enter the space and as they move up through each of these levels so we see right here there's a split and we've got some people that go down and some people that continue notice the line that continues is a little bit thicker in red as we move forward from the next split right here right we go up some people come off, some people keep going. Then some more people come off, then some more people keep going. So it's a very subtle diagram, but at the same time it shows a lot about how people are going through this particular space and how the crowd or the mass of people changes over time as they go up uh, in these various levels. So I love this. This is uh, a house that was done by Takaharu and Yui Tezuka. Um, who I actually had the great fortune of having as a, a studio head for one of the studios when I was in grad school at Berkeley. They were fantastic um, designers in Japan, produce tons and tons and tons of work. So, you know, some, some firms you know, do a couple projects a year. These guys do like hundreds of projects a year. Major, major work. Uh, but this is their floating roof house. And I think this is, at its, at its finest, a true diagram. So we have a sense that there is some kind of a roof, right? This right here is some kind of a roof. We have the idea that this house is perched on this cliff, right? And that the roof floats and the, the, um, the space flows through the house. So in your mind, you probably have an idea or something based on this diagram of what this house would look like, right? So let's take it a step further and let's start to actually look at the house, okay? So here's the next drawing, a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit tighter. Um, I like to show it because it's such a good sectional perspective drawing. But let's look at the actual house as it was built, right? So it's a perched on the side of this hill, and the hill really does flow right through the house. The doors in the side of the house completely open up, uh, and you get this wide open house. And so the diagram really reflects what this building really is. I do, by the way, have a book. Um, this is from a, a while ago. I think it's 2007 or something one of my more precious books uh, that shows all of their projects and it has a lot of um, great pictures in it. Uh, you guys may have seen the project, the most well-known project that they did is the Corten Steel Snake, which you've probably seen before, this one. I don't know whether you've seen that building before in Japan, maybe. Very, very kind of famous building, great in the snow. Anyway, but if you're interested in more of their work, I have this. You're more than welcome to look at it. It's a great book, lots of, lots of pictures, uh, which is always what we like. So another example here, we're highlighting particular view corridors. So it's no surprise that we have something um, that is highlighted in a little red box here. That must be the place where you view from. And then there's a line that goes out to something. Right, so we're definitely looking at views or, or, or something along the way, or at least connections between what's happening here and what's happening beyond. Another example here, not, not arrows, so to speak, but definitely connections between various pieces. Um, and so we're just drawing those connections uh, across a central square. Another example here where we have kind of a raised platform or a stage and that that then interacts out into the cityscape as a whole. An example here of how air flows through a building. I actually have a little bit of a gripe related to this because um, generally speaking, unless you were doing some kind of diurnal um, cycling of temperature where you were trying to, I don't know, it just doesn't quite work. This, this lower section, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. This would work fine as a stack cooling thing. This one would very rarely bring in any cold air. It would mostly bring in warmer air because it's higher and there it wouldn't flow correctly. So anyway, I agree with this much more. <laughs> 
and I think you should just get rid of this altogether. But anyway, the idea is that it's airflow uh, through a particular building. Sometimes you want to diagram and show building components. You want to show the skin against the core of the building. You want to show the structure of the building uh, against the, the rest of the building. You want to show how the building is heating and cooling or, or something like that. And so this is really highlighting a particular piece of the building. A lot of times these are done in exploded axonometrics or exploded perspectives where we lift up part of the building, where we pull off part of the building so we can kind of see in. Uh, in this particular example, we have a core of the building and then we have a skin that wraps the building. So they've lifted the skin up so that we can see the core underneath. That works really nicely as a, as a diagram. Sometimes it's about structure. And so you might see how all the columns flow through the building. Maybe it's about how the skin is attached to the building or wraps around the building. Um, this is the Sendai Media Tech by Toyo Ito. This is one of his sketches. I don't speak Japanese, nor can I read Japanese. Some of you probably can. Um, but I can tell enough from this diagram that there is basically a set of floor plates. Now, I'm a little bit biased because I know what the building is. But even if I didn't know what the building was, I can tell that there's a bunch of floors that are going across here. right? And then there's some kind of a mesh net-like object that goes up between all of the floors and connects those floors. right? So if I had to guess, those, those mesh-like objects would be structure, They'd be circulation, they'd be elevators, they'd be something that punches up through those various floors. Okay? So if we move forward and we start to look at this building itself, uh, oh, I sh probably should have done this in a different order. Th another set of diagrams of this building, this is the figure ground, black and white, density of the archives. It happens to be a media archive. Um, so density of where that stuff is stored versus public space. Same diagrammatic technique as before. Now we look at this in three dimensions. We've got those, those floor plates that I was talking about. We've got these tubes that punch through the floor, and we've got a skin that's applied to the building. Okay, So let's look at an actual photograph of the building so we can start to see it. Well, not quite yet. I'm out of order. Right? We see a few more 3, 3D models, the deformations, how the structure works, and then we get into what the building actually is. Very, very cool building. Each of the floors is held up by these series of columns that are twisting. Inside of the columns that are twisting are all the building services. So any of the, the plumbing, the HVAC, the stairways, the elevators, right? If we look at this particular example right there, there's the stairways that go up through the building. Right here, there's your elevator going up through the building. So these nested columns are housing all of those facilities. This one here, I'm not exactly sure what comes up through that. It's probably plumbing. Right? But the point is that he's using these punches or these, these twisting columns to actually use, to, to provide the services for the building. Um, the interesting side story has nothing to do with this class, but I can't resist telling side stories. So um, when Toyo Ito was designing this particular building, there has to be by code a fire separation between the emergency stairwell, right, this, and what's going on on the outside. So if you, for example, were on the second floor of this building, and there was a, or let's say the third floor of this building, and you needed to get out, and there was a raging fire on the second floor of the building, you needed to be able to go past the fire through one of these. So it would probably creep you out a little bit if you had to walk past a glass wall with a raging fire on the other side. True? Right? So number one, he needed a way for the glass to be insulated such that it wouldn't be hot to the touch as you were escaping by code. So he used a special kind of glass. It's called intumescent glass. And inside the layers of glass, there's actually a gel that, that um, provides the insulation, essentially, between the fire uh, and you as you walk down. Pretty cool. So the technology was such that he could actually leave that clear when the fire was burning, or he could choose to have it turn frosted. And so in the case of this, he had it turn frosted so you wouldn't have to walk by and freak out that there was a fire. Uh, but it's really cool use of building technology and materials, uh, which is just kind of a fun side note, but at the same time, interesting. Another example of the building from the outside, you can see these, right? Remember, if there was a raging fire here on the second floor, right? You can get through. Uh, but you can get a sense for what this building really is. It's strong floor plates, these twisting columns punch up through the building, uh, and it makes a really unique uh, and interesting building. 
Another example here of a structural diagram where various flex points would be in, in this sort of a structure. I told you that there were lots of exploded axonometrics that identify building components that work as diagrams. Here's an example here where we have a center core and we have a skin and we've pulled it off the building uh, to get a better sense of what's going on inside. Uh, in this particular example, we've got the kind of the, the skyscraper esh building, but we've got these little quote jewels that are inside, these voids. Those are highlighted in color um, in contrast to the rest of the space. Sometimes it might be about structure or structural grids. And so we look at this um, as a series of diagrams relating to how structure uh, would support the building framework. This particular one, you can barely see it. I can see it a lot better on my screen than you can on yours. Uh, but this has to do with how the building is, is being heated or cooled. Where, what's, where's the stack cooling effect? Uh, this is done with just a gradient rather than a set of arrows, but you could very easily have done a set of arrows to show uh, the stack cooling instead. But it just depends on, on what you're trying to do uh, with your particular diagram. Uh, another example here, this is a, a building facade. Um, adding materials on it by itself is kind of showcasing what the various materials would be. Um, which can be a diagram in and of itself. Where are materials applied and what do they look like? Anybody know this building? Anybody been to this building? Pantheon, good. Anybody been there? Okay, so if you are ever in Rome, you have to make me a promise right now, okay? I'm not gonna ask you to go see the building. I'm gonna ask you to go sit in the building for at least 45 minutes. So it doesn't mean you can just walk in and walk out. I want you to go sit in there, right? bring something to drink, and just enjoy it for a while. This is one of the coolest buildings ever, period. It's awesome, awesome building, okay? Something that we don't understand particularly well, okay? So in this particular building, it's 150 feet in diameter. It's also 150 feet tall. So in diagrammatic form, there's a perfect sphere that fits right inside. And we can see that the touch of it right here as it comes down. So it just barely touches the bottom, the top, and each side. Now to get a sense for size of something like this, right, 150 feet would be like half of a football field. So it's a lot bigger than you think it is. So let's look at it in photographic form. There's the doors coming into the building. Now the doors, if we back up a second, the doors are right here to right there. That's it. And they're massive doors. So as we go forward and we look at those doors, right, much, much taller than we are, notice also as we come inside, that's what it looks like from the outside. Not the most impressive building from the outside. Inside is a little different, however. Okay, so here's all the little people. Oops, hold on. So there's all the little people, right? They're, they're down here. Take a look right here at this ribbon, and then we'll go back a couple slides to the drawing, that's that ribbon right here. Oops, I start drawing without saying to draw. That's that, that's that ribbon right there. So we're only in photographs seeing the bottom quarter of the building. So it's significantly taller than you think it is. Right? Now, of course, the Pantheon also has a great um, open oculus right up here at the top that allows light in. So if I were diagramming this, I could also diagram it with an arrow that shows that the light comes in and leaves a spot on the wall, and that spot moves over time. It's really cool, right? It is also open, which means that the very center down here, right here, has to have a drain, because the rain does fall inside the building. So you have to think about that, too. Anyway, very cool building. You guys all are making your promise to go sit in there for 45 minutes when you go to Rome, right? Okay, I'm serious. Sometimes you might be talking about how a building changes over time, how glass is, is reflective and then it turns transparent, uh, and something like that. So you might do a series of side-by-side -side images. Sometimes you want to use type or typography to be part of your diagram. And so instead of using arrows or flow lines or the kinds of things that we've been talking about, maybe you use type instead. So maybe you take a building right, that has these various components a lobby, a courtyard, locker room, whatever it is, and you instead of color coding 
or drawing little arrows and labeling, you just make big text that fills up those various components of the building. And so you get, this works very nicely as a diagram, you quickly understand what's happening in various sections. And in this particular example, we have option one, two, and three uh, of the same building. But in this context, we also really quickly get a good sense of what's happening in each particular place, rather than having to draw it in. Something like this might be about, there's the stage, right? Stuff that's happening above the stage, stuff that's happening below the stage, but we understand really quickly that that is, in fact, the stage. Another example here, various blocks of text and how they come together. This is of a library, right? And the various things that happen in a library and how they're organized spatially and how that becomes certain rooms or certain spaces. So you can use type just as you would any other element as part of a diagram. Uh, this is a little bit more um, city planning based, but it has a lot of text in it. It has a lot of little plus signs and minus signs um, that have to do with the connections uh, between various city, regional, or oceanic green horizons. Not my project. Sometimes it's about movement, and you just want to show how people move through a particular space uh, over time. So it can be as simple as lines that flow across a particular um, diagram. Anybody recognize this? No? Doesn't look familiar? What if I told you this is all a place that you've all been? Bingo. So this is San Francisco. And what this is, is it was something that the, the Exploratorium put together. And they took the GPS data from all the taxi cabs in San Francisco, and they recorded where those taxi cabs go. So this is, in its essence, a map of the city of San Francisco through the eyes of a taxi cab. So it's a diagram of San Francisco, but we get a really good sense, very quickly, of what certain things are. Right? We can very clearly see Market Street. We can very, very clearly see the freeways. Right? This would be the bridge right there. We can see the freeways, there's 280, here's 80 coming down. What's right here? SFO, right? Notice the dead end, right? Everybody takes off at that point or arrives. So the point is that we can understand the city of San Francisco without any other context. We understand what's happening in San Francisco. And so it's a really good example of a diagram and it's certainly something that's used uh, over time. I adapted this, this was one of my thesis drawings had to do with flight patterns from San Francisco and where those flight patterns um, took off and landed. Um, in this particular example, there's two primary runways right, that are going off uh, from SFO, going those two directions, landings and takeoffs. Right? All of these are helicopters that go in and go out, and they go off at a 90 degree angle. It's kind of interesting. Right? So you can use that and adapt those same strategies over time. The other thing that I did, you guys saw this on your handout for today, this was um, SFO. This was a long time ago before Terminal 2 was open again. Um, so there's this, this great void of blank space that's right here that would be Terminal 2. Um, at the time that I was doing it, it wasn't open. Uh, international Terminal, I, I didn't include as part of this, but the International Terminal would be right here. Um, so this is just Terminal 3 and Terminal 1. Uh, and this is how people move through the space. And so I went to the airport and I sat and I watched how people moved and I made this little diagram of a bunch of little dots. My thesis had to do with the airport, so I had to do a bunch of this stuff as background. But this is in the same context as that cab spotting video, this is, or the, the cab spotting diagram. This is essentially how do people use the space? And what's the frequency of people using that particular uh, piece of the space? There it is a little bit blown up. Another example here might be a view diagram. Maybe you need to, to get some privacy, right? So you, you deliberately shape something such that you can never see past a certain corner, and you're showing that. Maybe it has to do with some kind of a site diagram. I can tell really quickly that the, in this particular context, there's some kind of a, 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 like a river or something that flows through the site. There's a bunch of trees on the site, and there's something happening at whatever that yellow is, right? There's a bridge or, or something. This uh, was actually two series of postcards. Um, we were asked to diagram our thesis process. 
when we were in thesis. This is what I thought my thesis was going to be. I knew what I was going to do. It was going to be easy. As soon as I started my thesis, it turned into this. Right? So it was a simple diagram of how my life felt at that moment. Right? Another example here of movement through a space identified by the dotted blue lines. I think one of the things that helps this diagram a lot is the little people. So we have the dotted blue lines, but then we also have the people, so we understand that this is how people are moving through a particular space. And that then evolves into this diagram, which is about the, the, the cutout of the big mass um, to create the building uh, or the shape itself. Uh, these are a little bit blurry, kind of hard to see. We'll skip through those. Uh, sometimes it has to do with sun, wind, rain. To me, this is way over the top. Um, the, the image by itself would have been nice without all the diagram stuff on it. And I don't think you could pick a more corny version of the sun as part of this diagram. It's just not, not the best. But it, it, does, it does constitute exactly what we're talking about. Um, another example here uh, of movement. The other, the other and last one that I'll talk about is the idea of transformation. And it's essentially saying, this is how it's normally done, and what if we did it this way? So it's a two-part, right? This is what's normal, what if we did it this way? So we can see here, um, normally, it's the city sky, skyline with these big, tall buildings. What if we turn the building on its side? Right? So it's a what if. Show some kind of a transformation. Uh, typically, back of house, chamber, front of house. What if we did it this way? Above, chamber, and below. Right? So it's the what if. What if we took this void and we sliced it up and then we took one of the pieces and flipped it around? Right? So those are, those are the examples that I've kind of gone through. And now we're going to spend some time and actually go through the techniques and how do we do this in Illustrator. I think what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you do part one first, which is that we're going to find some kind of a building to work with. If you have one of your own designs that you want to try to diagram on top of, that's great. If you don't have one and you want to, to pick a, you know, a known building and diagram on top of that, that's fine. So we'll take maybe 10 minutes. I'd like you to find a plan and a section. They don't have to be the same building, but one plan and one section. right? And then I'll come back and I'll show you kind of diagramming on top of those in Illustrator. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. So at, um, Let's say at 9 o'clock, we'll start back up again. So you have until 9 to find your images. OK, so I trust by now you guys have all um, found a building that you're particularly interested in, or uh, at least are, are having the starting points for, for this search. Um, so I was, I was playing around with trying to, to sort out which building I wanted to do. And I, I, I wanted to pick one that was a, a classic building that maybe you were familiar with or maybe you weren't. Uh, but that, at the same time, would be a very, very good one for uh, kind of showcasing diagramming techniques. Uh, so I ended up picking uh, the Kimball Art Museum. I don't know. Anybody familiar with this building? Have you seen it in your other classes? Maybe. I thought it was particularly relevant because those of you in 121 are going to be doing museums and having to do with lighting. Um, so this is um, a fantastic uh, Louis Kahn building that has some of the best lighting for a museum possible. And so the good news is that Arc Daily has a great um, set of, of, of featured buildings that are called their classics. And the Kimball Art Museum is one. Um, there's a lot of great photos of it. There's also a plan and a section, um, et cetera, that I can work from. So as we look at some of these pictures, uh, one of the big things about the galleries that are in the, um, the Kimball Art Museum is that they're barrel vaulted. But at the top of each gallery, there's a skylight. And then there's these little shades that kind of swoop down on either side that allow the light to be reflected and bounced into the gallery to provide very even lighting rather than direct lighting for the, the images that are on the walls, uh, which is great because not only are you getting a lot of natural light, none of it's directly hitting any of the, the, um, the paintings, et cetera. So uh, it's a particularly good um, building to try to diagram in section. Um, so we're going to start with that in section. I found um, several sections that looked good. This one was kind of the more technical section. Uh, so I thought we'd start with this uh, as the diagramming piece. So I've gone ahead and I've right-clicked and I've saved the image 
onto my flash drive. And I'm going to go ahead and open up um, Illustrator so that I can start this uh, diagrammatic exploration. So let me go ahead and I'll go to File, New. And I asked you to use um, a letter sized piece of paper. Um, I'm going to use it in landscape orientation so uh, that I have a little bit more space. And I'll go ahead and say OK. Now remember, since we're doing vector-based graphics, it doesn't really matter what size we end up uh, choosing our image to be, because we can always scale it up or scale it down later on. So I'm going to start just like we do in the world of InDesign. I'm going to place my section image onto the page. So I'll go to File and then Place. And I'll drop that section image. onto my page. Now it's a little bit larger than I wanted. So let me go ahead and, and press Control minus. And then I'll use this over here, this free transform tool, to scale my image down. And I'm going to hold down Shift so that it stays in proportion as I scale the image down. Now I'm really only worried about that first kind of floor there. I'm not worried about the, the, the space down below. Uh, and I'm going to work on this particular barrel vault there. So now if I look at my layer stack here. I have one layer, and this layer has the image on it. And if I were to expand the layer stack, I'd have one linked file that is shown. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rename that layer, and I'll call this base image so that I know what this layer is. After that, I'll go ahead and lock the layer so that I can't accidentally select it or move it. And then I'll create a new layer, and I'll call that new layer uh, diagram or maybe diagram 1. And so that diagram 1 layer is now active, and the base image is locked so that I can't, I can't uh, adjust it at all. So now if I were to zoom in, I'm going to be responsible for creating a diagram that represents how the light washes onto uh, this dome ceiling and therefore gets into the space as a whole. Now I may need to simplify a bit. Um, such that I might need to, to redraw parts of this, this building, which I could do. I could add another layer, and I could call this building. Let's put it below the diagram layer. And then I could use my pen tool, and I could trace over the building. Make sure it doesn't have a fill right now. And I could then ultimately fill in that as a, as a void. Looks like I need a little bit of adjustment. And at the same time, I don't think you guys want to sit here and watch me um, redraw this particular building. But you get the idea that I could draw over the top of it uh, as opposed to using the image as the backdrop. Okay, So now it comes time to figure out how I want to showcase um, the light entering the building. So I'm going to make sure that I'm on the diagram layer. And then I'm going to use my pen tool. And the first one that I'm going to do is I'm going to show light right, coming in and maybe bouncing and bouncing down into the space, something like that. Let's flip it so that I can see it. So I've got that kind of general bounce going through, and it's entering the space. Now, once I've done that, right? remember it's on the diagram layer, I can embellish this line a bit so that it doesn't look like just a basic line. And at this point, I could even take my base image here. Let me unlock it for just a second. And let me change the opacity down so it doesn't interfere too much with the diagram that we're trying to do. All right, so let me go back and lock this. And let's look at this, this, this path here that's representing my sun. Now, first off, black probably isn't the right choice for sun. So maybe it's time to switch the color. And we'll go to kind of a, a darker yellow, something like that, which is somehow by its nature more indicative of sun. I could also take my line, and I could come over to the stroke menu here, and I could increase the thickness of it, okay, which also might be appropriate as part of my uh, drawing. Now, there are other options that are available to me relating to the stroke. So if I click on my little flyout menu and say Show Options, I now have some more options. So we, we covered this before, I believe. But I can turn on 
a dashed line instead of a solid line as an option. I can also control how large the dashes are. So I could say 12 point and then 24 point break, and I'd get smaller lines with larger breaks. I could have um, you know, a two point dash and a one point break, and I'd have a very close together. So you see I have a lot of flexibility uh, with that. Now, I'm going to uncheck that, but I also have the ability to add arrowheads on the start or the end of the line. So in my case, I started the line here, and I ended the line here, and I can choose to apply a various styled arrows to the end of my line. So you can see I can cycle through and pick a variety of different arrows. So that may or may not be something that's desirable. Okay. Now, if I want it to get a little bit fancier than that, I can work with my profiles, which we talked about before, and I could cause the line, oops, I, sorry, I have to select it first. And it may not let me do it with an arrowhead on it. Let's see here. Right. So I could cause the line to, to start thin, get thicker, and get thin. Notice it didn't affect the arrowhead, however. I could choose to have it start fat at one end and get thinner. I could choose to make the arrowhead go away altogether and then start to use these profiles to, to identify what's happening, right, where it gets bigger. Remember, I can also use the width tool to widen up a particular part of the line if I wanted it to get wider, or something like that, okay, which may or may not be an advantage. Okay? So I have some flexibility in terms of what I do with the width tool. Now let's go back for a second to where we have just the normal line. And I'm going to take off the arrowhead. Now maybe instead, I don't want it to look quite so stark as, as a line. And I can instead use something called a brush. And that's really what we're getting into today, is that we have brushes available to us in Illustrator. And so if I click, remember, I'm in the Essentials workspace. And if, if you're not seeing what I'm seeing, remember, you can go to Reset Essentials, which will get you back to the, the exact same thing that I'm seeing here. Uh, and we can click on the little brush icons. It looks like a cup with some brushes stuck in it. And when I do that, we see that I have a basic line. I also have a feathered charcoal line. I have something called a divider. I have something called a mop. And I have a cut here pattern brush. Okay? I also, up at the top here, have a round, a 15 point round, an oval, an oval, and a flat brush. So if I go through these presets, let me select my line here, and I were to pick the round brush, for example, we can see that it has rounded ends on either end. If I were to pick the oval brush, and we were to zoom in here a little bit, you can see that the line has an oval end. It's thicker here. When we go off in this direction, it's a little bit thinner. And then when we go down here, it gets a little bit thicker again. It would be as if you were drawing with a chiseled brush you know, by hand. Um, if we switched and did the flat point brush, for example, oops, sorry, I have to select it. The flat brush, right? this is almost more of a calligraphy brush, where we have a nice flat. It's coming down here at a certain angle. When we go across, it gets bigger, and then it gets thinner. So you can see I'm starting to customize the line a fair amount. If I have moved down here to the charcoal feather, the brush is going to take on the character, hopefully, of kind of a charcoal line. So it's going to have little gaps in it. Okay? which may or may not be advantageous. Now, this is by no means a comprehensive list of the various brushes. We can go to the little flyout menu here, and we can go to Open Brush Library, and you see that we have arrows, artistic brushes, borders, bristle brushes, decorative brushes, vector packs, um, 3D brushes, it looks like. Uh, I'm going to go to Artistic, and I'm going to look at first the chalk, charcoal, and pencil brushes. And so if I do that, you can see that I have a whole variety of brushes that I can pick from. So we use this charcoal feather brush, but I could instead use any one of these other uh, brushes. So there's a thin charcoal brush. right? There's a charcoal brush. There's, let's see, that's a pencil line. There's a thin pencil line. 
there's a thicker pencil line. Okay, so I can kind of play through what these various options are. Obviously, the thicker they get, right, the thicker my lines are, and I may have to come back to the stroke menu and adjust the weight down, whoops, maybe like 0.5, and that would make it a little bit thinner. So the point is I could still adjust the weight independently of these artistic brushes. Now, if I wanted this to look more like, say, a watercolor brush, I could load up under the brushes here. I could load up the artistic watercolor brushes. And then I could select my line, and I could apply a watercolor brush to it. So if I zoom out, you might be able to see this a little bit more. Now it's looking more like a watercolor brush has been applied. So you can see I have a lot of flexibility in terms of what these brushes can, can do for me. I'm going to go back to more of a charcoal brush, something like that. And then I'm also going to add an arrowhead on my own. So I'll come down here, and I'll draw in my own arrowhead, something like that. Make sure it has the same brush applied to it. And now I've, I've kind of customized that little bit uh, of an arrow. So it's a little bit more flexible, uh, and I can have a, a fairly good reaction uh, or a diagram of what this arrow looks like. Okay? So that may be one strategy for how you want to portray the light entering this, this particular space. Maybe instead I want to show somehow that the light gets very diffuse as it comes down. So I end up wanting to create a different diagram. Let me go ahead and create a new diagram here. We'll call this diagram two. two. And I'll go ahead and turn off diagram one. And so this time, maybe I want to create kind of a fill region where this light comes in. something like that and I'll fill it with yellow and let me make one quick adjustment here pull that up to match the arc and I want this to appear instead of being a solid color I want it to start yellow and end up getting transparent as I come down okay so I want a gradient to be applied to it so I'm going to select my my object right here I'm going to come over to the gradient tools and I want it to be a linear gradient. So I'll go ahead and click on the linear gradient here. Type is linear. Oops, sorry. I was in my stroke rather than my fill. There, I have to be in my fill. I want it to be a linear gradient. So we'll say linear. And I want the degree to be at 90 so that it's starting black and getting transparent as I come down here or getting to white. And I want the color right here to be yellow. So I'll pick it yellow. And I can also adjust it so that more of the yellow is there at the top. And then it starts to fade down as it gets a little bit further along. Now maybe I also want to see through it. So I'll adjust the opacity a little bit. So maybe 60% opacity, maybe 70%. And so now I have a different strategy for how the light is, is entering and filling this particular space. Maybe I'll take this same piece, I'll copy it, and then I'll reflect it. So I'm going to go to Transform, Reflect, Vertical, say OK. And I'll put this one over on this side to show how it enters both sides, for example. Right? So this is very different than the arrow that I showed in the first example. This is using a gradient, but it's essentially doing the same thing in diagrammatic form. It's showing how the light would be entering this particular space and therefore kind of fading out as we get towards uh, the ground level. Does that kind of make sense? So it's a different strategy doing very much what I've talked about before. So let's open up a plan as a different example. I'm just going to go to New. And we'll do a new letter again, and it could be in landscape. We'll say OK. And I'm going to go to File, and then Place. And I'll place in uh, a plan. And 
looks really tiny, so we're going to have to go to the free transform tool, see if we can blow it up and make it a little bit bigger. All right. So this is, this is not the best quality image in the, in the world, but we'll go ahead and use it. So once again, I'm going to rename this to be base drawing. And then I'll create a new layer above it, and we'll call this diagram one. Oops, diagram one. Now maybe in this context, I'd like to um, draw how the people move through the space, for example. So we'll do more of a movement. So I could just start with the pen tool, and I could show somebody coming through and entering here and walking their way around. And then that person decided to leave, something like that. And one of the things that, that helps a lot when you do these kinds of diagrams where people are moving through space is that we adjust, let's make that a little bit thicker of a line, we go ahead and, and choose a color. So remember color theory a little bit. This is active, so maybe I'll pick red as my color, something like that. And then I'll also adjust the opacity down so that when I start to overlap various lines together, right, we'll see how they, they start to overlap. So let me go ahead and draw it again. And so we've got somebody else. And this takes some time to do because you want to mimic how people kind of walk. And you may find that you need to be in the particular space for a while to see how people are actually uh, inhabiting and working through the space. You know, maybe this person decided they wanted to take a little bit of a detour there. And in the interest of time, I'm only doing this side. right? And then maybe I do it again. Let's make sure that the opacity on that one is set down to 60%. So you can see how they're starting to overlap. And then I do maybe another one. And you can see over time, you can start to do the same kind of thing that the cab spotting diagram would do, where you're showing how people move through the space, for example. So we start to, to do that. Now, on any one of these, right? I could obviously put arrows on the, the length of the line to help, to, to help show which way people were coming or going. Or I could just use the density of lines. The more of these lines that I create, the better, uh, you know, the, the, the better I'm going to get a sense for what this really should look like. And perhaps I should come in and take the base drawing here and change the opacity of that down just like I did on the other one so that the diagram stands out a little bit more. Um, and I'm doing this a little differently for the screen so that it's a little bit lighter than I normally would, would have done it so that you guys can see it a little bit better. Okay? But maybe I want to take it a step further. And so you guys saw when I did the diagram of the San Francisco airport, I ended up wanting these to be dots rather than, than lines. So I could, for example, select one of these curves. I could come over, actually, let me select them all to make my life a little bit easier. And let me lock the base drawing so I don't accidentally select that. There we go. And let me come back to my stroke menu. Let me show my options. And let's make it a dashed line that is one point with a one point. And so now it looks like I have a bunch of dotted lines, which can help in the overall look right because there's a little bit more um, people but maybe I want to take this a step further than just the dotted lines maybe I want to show little footprints of how people are moving through the scene so I'm gonna make a brush that shows people walking rather than uh, just this dotted line so let me zoom in here for a second and I'm gonna draw some little feet so I'll use the pen tool here and let me change my color so that I'm solid. All 
All right, so there's a little footprint. Let me take that footprint. I'm going to control C to copy it, control V to paste it. Then I'll right click on it, go to transform, and I'm going to reflect horizontally. So I have the opposite of it. And we'll put it about like that. So I have these two little feet footprints. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select these two footprints. And I'm going to come over to my brushes. And instead of picking a brush, I'm actually going to take these objects and I'm going to drag them to the brush window here. And you see it kind of highlights in orange. That's going to allow me to create a new scatter brush, which is what I want. So I'll go ahead and say OK for scatter brush. And so this gives me some options. I'm going to call this footprints. And I can choose to have my size, fi size fixed or variable. Obviously, these are footprints. They need to be the same size. So we'll leave them as fixed. The spacing, do I want it to be fixed or variable? Again, footprints, they're going to be rather consistent. So we'll leave them um, uh, fixed. Scatter, I don't want them to scatter. Rotation, right? I want them either to be fixed or random. Random would be, you know, occasionally I'm, I'm going different directions. I'd rather keep them fixed for right now. Okay, we'll come back and we'll do a different example uh, with something else. So I'll go ahead and say, okay, I do want my rotation relative to my path, not to the page. And I'll go ahead and say, okay. So now we see that I have a little brush that's called footprints. So let me come back and zoom out here for a second. And I'll take one of my paths here and I'll apply the footprints brush to it. And so now, instead of having just the dotted line, I have a little series of footprints that follows along. Let me take each of these and I'll apply the footprints to those. And suddenly, we start to see a diagram emerge that has a bunch of little footprints on it. Okay? So this may or may not be a strategy that you ultimately want to employ. And maybe you like footprints, maybe you don't like footprints. But the point is that you can use this with other things. Right? Instead of having footprints, I could, for example, have arrows. Right? So I could draw in an arrow. And I don't want that to be a dashed line. I wanted it to be solid like that. I could take this arrow and I can drag it to the brushes. Scatter brush, OK. And this is going to be arrows. Same options here relative to the path. I'll go ahead and say OK. And now I can take one of these and turn it into a series of arrows that follow through. So if the, the footprints were too cutesy for you, for example, maybe the arrows would work for you. Right? So you have a lot of flexibility in what you can create with this sort of uh, a brush strategy. Now, if we wanted, for example, to do something uh, that showed how, um, I don't know, how birds flew or something, right? and this is not so much for diagram, but I'm trying to show you this anyway, I could go ahead and I could draw a bird. Hmm. Drawing a bird's a little challenging. Let's see how I do. Do a fill of the bird. If my bird's really ugly, I apologize. Okay, it probably needs a little refinement, but it kind of looks like a bird. Whatever. Okay, so I'll take this. And uh, once again, I'm going to drag it over into my brushes. I'm going to create a scatter brush. But this time, I want a couple different things. One, the size is going to be random. And I can choose how much it can change. So I could say that it goes down 70% and it goes up, uh, let's go more, 44 to 300%. The spacing, I want to be random. Right? It comes in at 10 to 100. The scatter, I want to be random. Go a little bit to a little bit there. The rotation, I want it to be random. And it's going to be relative to the page this time. So I'll go ahead and say OK. And now if I apply, let me just create another curve here. If I apply that brush, 
you can see that my birds are not going to be limited to following in line. They're going to randomly rotate, and they're also going to get larger and smaller. So it's a different strategy for how you might be able to create you know, the same scatter brush. It just is a little bit different in its look. Now, all of these are editable. If you come back and double click, for example, you can choose to change the various settings. I could say I wanted it more spacing, more random, uh, etc. I could also come back, like let's say the footprints here. I didn't like the size; it was too big. I could go minus. Let's go minus 50. And I could say OK. And now. If I applied the footprints, the footprints would be much smaller. Right? So you've got a lot of flexibility there with, with how you can change things um, as part of that. The other types of brushes, the art brushes, um, are, are less common for diagrams. But since we're talking about brushes, I'll at least explain them. Um, the art brushes are such that you've probably seen um, vine-like drawings where we have little, like, curls that happen, uh, and those, you've seen something like this probably, uh, oops, let me create another set here. All right, little, little things like that, essentially, right? Now, I can take something like this and I can make that into a brush. Now, it would be helpful if I started with just a straight section here. So let's say we'll curl that there. And then we'll keep going. And we'll curl this one this way. OK, so maybe it's like that. If I were to t drag these objects here over, and instead of creating a scatter brush, I created an art brush. Say, OK. Again, I have the options. It's going to let me choose which direction the curve is going to go. You see I have that little preview there. And what this does is it allows me to have this particular thing applied to any curve that I draw. So let me go ahead and draw a few curves as examples here. All right, so let's say I draw a curve that looks like this. I can take this curve, and I can apply that to it. Oops, I had it going the wrong direction. Hold on, I got to didn't do what I wanted it to do. There's a new supply of strokes. Yeah, it's applying it sideways, unfortunately. Hold on. Got to love it when things just don't do what you want it to do. Yeah, so they're going in the right direction, but I'm getting lots of little ones instead of one big one. So it's got to be a setting. Stretch to fit stroke length. There we go. Apply to strokes. No. All right, well, I'm failing miserably at, at showing you this example. Good news is you don't need it for today. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's, 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 it should stretch like this along whatever the curve is. And for some reason, it doesn't, it doesn't like me. So I'll come back, and I'll show you a different example. Essentially, all of those brushes, however, are what the charcoal watercolor type brushes are. So those are the presets that were made using these art brushes. Um, and so I apologize that this isn't working for me. Um, oh, so it's not just me. It has something to do with how I created the curve. OK, well, anyway, I'll come back and, and sort it out. Um, so those are art brushes. We did colors. Um, the one last thing that I wanted to review for you guys is that maybe let's go ahead and turn all of these off and do a diagram two layer here. Maybe we just instead wanted to do um, color coding. We wanted to fill regions. Okay? If that was the case, uh, I could draw regions with my pen tool. I could trace over um, 
the, the various regions. So I could go say this area here is all going to be filled in with um, red, for example, and I could adjust the opacity. So it was color coded. You guys get that, right? It's relatively self explanatory. But sometimes you want to be able to use the live paint tool or you don't want to have to go through and manually trace over everything. And so Illustrator has something built into it, and it can be a little bit finicky with how you use it, called the Live Trace tool. And so let me go ahead and bring this, or excuse me, it's called Image Trace now. So I'm bringing that back up, and I'm going to take this image, and I'm going to go up to the Object menu, and I'm going to go to Image Trace Make. And what this does is it takes your object and it converts it into Illustrator shapes. And there are a bunch of presets, so it's worth going through the presets. But I could say this is a technical drawing, and it's going to look a little bit sharper. I could say this is line art, and we can see what that looks like. It depends a little bit on the the building that you're trying to do as to which one's going to turn out nicely. Um, That one's not a particularly good one. Let's say three colors. See what happens here. The other option that we have is we can go through and customize how these are showing up. If the presets aren't work, working correctly, right? we can go into the options, which are right here. I clicked on this little icon right there to get into the image trace options. And this can let us control, say, a threshold amount that's going to change and as I slide this you can see how much or how little is traced. We can also go back to a different preset and I could go basically if you pick one that looks fairly close to what you're trying to create then you can go through with your tracing result and get different end results. All right, depending on what you're after. Once you do this, you can click on Expand. And this then creates individual shapes that you can then edit and or you can um, select using the white arrow or the direct select tool, in which case I could actually change the, the color of this shape, say, to pink or something like that. So it's a way of getting some of these diagrams uh, to show up. Now, what I would do if I were doing this, let me back up a few. Oh, it's not going to let me back up that far. Um, just delete it and bring it in. I would make a duplicate of it before I actually did the live trace. So here I am before the live trace. Let me duplicate this layer. And then I do the live trace on the layer, uh, on the, the duplicate layer, so that I can come back and, and see my actual drawing underneath. So I do want to point out one other thing um, that you may find useful. Let me go back to my diagram 2 layer. If we have a bunch of lines that overlap, so let me create quickly some lines that overlap. there, bear with me. All right, let's turn these off. And let me make these a little bit bigger so that you can see them. OK, so I have these lines that, that I drew that all overlap. I would like to be able to fill in certain of these regions. right? Some of you have, have seen me do this before, but I like to reinforce it at this stage of the game because it's the kind of thing that you'll end up using in Charlie Harper as well. Um, once I have a series of lines, I don't want to lose the lines that I have. So once again, I'll duplicate the Diagram 2 layer. And I'm going to do a Live Paint on the duplicate. So I'm actually going to rename Diagram 2 to be Live Paint. 
and then I'll turn off the, the regular diagram two layer so that I don't get confused with it and I'll work just on the live paint layer. So with live paint, I need to select all of my objects. Then I need to come over to the live paint tool, which is hidden underneath the width tool. Never mind, it's hidden underneath the shape tool. I can find it. There it is, right there. Live paint bucket. And when I move over the object, it gives me this little icon that says click to make a live paint group. When I do that, it's going to let me start to fill in various of these squares, and it kind of highlights them in red. I can choose my color, and I can start to fill in the various regions. Now, I can change the color as I go along, or I could finish, click on this expand button, which makes the actual shapes out of it, and then I could come back with the white arrow or the direct select tool and select any individual pieces and change those colors to something else. Now one of the, the reasons that I like having the live paint on a different layer from the diagram is that I can turn back on the diagram layer and I could, for example, adjust the strokes on the diagram layer so that I had black strokes with no fill and maybe I actually wanted to take it a step further and I wanted to apply a brush to all of the strokes those can be on top of right the colored regions that are behind I probably need to unlock this lock that and I need to select all of my uh, lines because they shouldn't have a there we go and so those colored regions then fall underneath the the objects that have the the fancier stroke applied to them okay and so once again I can pick any one of these and I can change the color uh, to whatever color is appropriate. Remember you can also load up any swatches that you wanted and have those swatches applied to these as well as you start to color in various regions. All right? Are there any questions? I know that's a lot to take in but if you start to try to figure out what you want to diagram and then you can figure out the strategies behind it. I just like to throw a bunch of ideas at you so that you can see how you would do a various uh, set of examples. All right.